Miller suffered serious head injuries when his car, which was in the lead, left the track and crashed into a concrete wall. And there's Nicky Larrabee put it, you know. It was the weekend when God took his finger off Formula One. Julian Lackaby headed straight to Brazil after Senna's death was announced. I wasn't family, but I had to keep the family going. So one kept going really on adrenaline and everything else until after the funeral, which was a unique occasion. Um, I, mean, I remember watching J.F. Kennedy's funeral in Washington in 1963 and even Winston Churchill's when I was a young boy. I think I'd never seen anything like this, but the Senna funeral in Brazil was just quite something you wouldn't want to be part of because of what happened, but on the other hand, being there, it kind of put everything into perspective. The body of Ayrton Senna arrived at Sao Paulo Airport in the early morning. It prompted a massive outpouring of national grief as it was transported to the city's legislative assembly, where up to 200,000 Brazilians are expected to pay their personal respects at the lying in state before tomorrow's funeral. But the estimates today were of a million on the streets and a hundred million watching on television. Here was a guy from Brazil, which has a fledgling motor industry, who could take on and beat the industrialized world. Here was somebody rather like Pele, who was a world figure and was universally respected. And during the nine years that I worked with him, I didn't understand, being based here in Europe, just how much he was revered in Brazil. The deaths of Ayrton Senna and Roland Ratzenberger proved to be a huge turning point, prompting the implementation of rigorous new safety measures in Formula One. The highest court of appeal in Italy later ruled that a mechanical failure was the cause of Senna's crash. This episode of Sporting Witness was made by me, Matt Pincus, using interviews from the BBC World Service archive. Julian Lackaby now runs a sports management company. Professor Sig Watkins died in 2012, age 84. This is the BBC World Service visiting a school in Thailand that is run by the children. The Me Thai Bamboo School was founded on principles of charity and leadership. Students are responsible for every aspect of running the school. There were no teachers in assembly. All of the children just led the occasion by themselves. The school run by kids at bbcworldservice.com slash peoplefixingtheworld or wherever you get your BBC podcasts. In 30 minutes, the documentary. South Africa is one of the most dangerous places in the world. With trust in the police falling, BBC Africa Eye joins two volunteer patrols who say they have no option but to defend themselves. We see the risks they take and ask who holds these patrols accountable. This is the BBC World Service, the world's radio station. BBC World Service, it's four o'clock GMT. This is Oliver Conway with the newsroom. A member of the Israeli War Cabinet gives the Prime Minister a three-week deadline to agree a post-war plan for Gaza. If we are to continue to fight shoulder to shoulder, the Cabinet must approve by June 8th. An action plan that will lead us to the realisation of the sixth strategic goal. Also on the newsroom, Ukrainian boxer Alexander Usyk becomes the first undisputed world heavyweight champion for 25 years. Bad weather hampers rescue efforts in southern Brazil. We could no longer see any houses, it was quite scary. We left everything, we left only with the clothes we were wearing. The US National Security Advisor meets Saudi Arabia's crown prince, and later. We managed to find a female and we introduced them together and it was the proudest thing I'd love at first sight. And only reindeer who has finally found a partner. First round up of our top stories. I'm Stuart McIntosh with the BBC News. Hello. President Biden's national security advisor has held talks with Saudi Arabia's crown prince in the latest US diplomatic initiative to try to halt the fighting in Gaza. Jake Sullivan met Mohammed bin Salman in the Saudi city of Dharam. Grant Ferret has more details. According to Saudi state media, the discussion focused on ways of boosting aid to Gaza and the pathway to achieving Palestinian statehood. The Saudis also said a draft bilateral deal with Washington was close to being finalized. Mr. Sullivan is due to visit Israel on Sunday for talks with the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. He's flatly opposed the Palestinian 
sovereignty, the United States has little to show for months of diplomacy, and if nothing else, it will hope to buy time. It's unlikely that Israel would step up its offensive in Rafa while Mr. Sullivan is in the region. A member of Israel's war cabinet has accused the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of leading the country towards an abyss because of his refusal to draw up a post-war plan for the Gaza Strip. In the latest sign of division, the heart of the government, Benny Gantz, made a series of demands, as Paul Adams explains. If the government does not adopt a six-point plan that he spelled out within the next three weeks, then he will lead his party out of the ruling government. That plan that he outlined included a plan to defeat Hamas, to bring hostages home, to create some kind of mechanism for the future governance of the Gaza Strip, and a number of other conditions. I think the point worth remembering about this is that he is not in a position to bring the government down, provided Mr. Netanyahu can retain the support of the far right. Tens of thousands of Israelis have been taking part in the latest protest in Tel Aviv to demand that the government secure the release of all the hostages still being held by Hamas. In one part of the city, police used water cannons to disperse anti gaza protesters. The mayor of the capital of New Caledonia says the French Pacific Territory is under siege after nearly a week of unrest over a change of voting rights. Six people have been killed since the trouble began. Yusuf Tanha reports. Sonia Lagarde said the city of Nomea remained far from calm. Hundreds of heavily armed members of the French security forces are patrolling the streets. France's interior minister announced the start of a major operation. 600 gendarmes are trying to regain control of the main road linking Umeya to its airport, which has been closed. New Zealand says it sold the permission of France to land military aircraft there to repatriate its citizens. Australia says it's assessing options for its nationals to leave New Caledonia safely. That was Yusuf Taha, Minister of McIntosh in London, bringing you the latest world news from the BBC. Further bad weather is hampering rescue efforts in the Brazilian state of Rio Grande do Sul, where floods have left huge areas underwater. In the three weeks since the storms first hit, heavy rains have caused rivers and lakes to overflow, killing at least 151 people. More than 100 are missing. Donald Trump has addressed thousands of gun owners in Texas, pledging to roll back any controls introduced by President Biden if he wins November's election. He also accused the president of weakness in dealing with criminal gangs. Our country is going to hell. Rapacious gangs and ruthless criminals are terrorizing our streets. It's time for a president who will replace weakness with strength, turn poverty to prosperity, and vanquish Joe Biden's corrupt tyranny with a great restoration of American freedom. We have to do that. Politically powerful national association is closely aligned with the Republican Party in opposing firearm restrictions. President Biden has repeatedly called the long-lapsed ban on assault weapons to be reinstated. The Ukrainian boxer Alexander Usyk has become the first undisputed world heavyweight champion in a quarter of a century. He beat Tyson Fury of Britain in a fiercely competitive contest in the Saudi capital Riyadh, which went the entire 12 rounds. The Ukrainian won on points. Furia, who is taller and heavier than Usyk, went into the match as the slight favourite. One of Ireland's leading entrepreneurs, the former international rugby player Tony O'Reilly, has died at the age of 88. He appeared for both Ireland and British and Lion, Lion Irish Lions rugby teams and went on to enjoy a high-profile business career. Mr O'Reilly turned Kerrygold Butter into one of Ireland's best-known global brands. He was also a philanthropist, directing money from U.S. donors into Northern Ireland. BBC News. Thank you. You're listening to the newsroom from the BBC World Service with Oliver Bacon. Nearly seven months into its ground invasion of Gaza, Israel has been unable to defeat Hamas. Israeli forces have also had to return to areas they secured earlier in the operation. Late on Saturday, new evacuation orders for Palestinians in northern Gaza. 800,000 people with the UN has also been forced to flee the southern city of Rafa in the past two weeks. Meanwhile, new cracks have emerged in the Israeli government. Just days after the defense minister criticized Benjamin Netanyahu, another member of the war cabinet, Benny Gantz, 
and threaten to resign unless the Prime Minister agrees clear strategy for the war and its aftermath within three weeks. If we are to continue to fight shoulder to shoulder, the Cabinet must approve by June 8th an action plan that will lead us to the realisation of six strategic goals. Bring back the hostages, topple the rule of Hamas, and ensure Israeli security control for the Gaza Strip. Our correspondent Paul Adams in Jerusalem told me more about what's worrying Mr Gantz. His concerns really are the same ones that we heard at... Netanyahu's government and Defence Minister Yoav Gallant just a few days ago, which is the absence of a clear plan, both for the conclusion of the war in Gaza, but also crucially for what happens afterwards. And so Mr. Gantz is doing something Gallant didn't do, which is to set a deadline of three weeks from now, after which he says that if the government does not adopt this six-point plan which he outlined, then he will withdraw his party from the coalition. So this really is the latest sign of the very deep divisions that have become increasingly apparent the longer this war has gone on. And what does it mean for the Israeli government? Is Mr Netanyahu likely to change his position on this? No, I don't think so. I think he'll call Mr Gantz's bluff. And the thing about this is Mr Gantz can threaten to withdraw from the government, but he knows that he is not capable of bringing the government down. Mr Netanyahu still has the support of the far-right parties. They are the ones on whom he relies heavily. And if Mr Gantz does carry out his threat in three weeks' time, the government will survive. He knows that, and there are some sceptics tonight who think that it is unlikely that he will carry out his threat on June the 8th. But it is, as I say, alongside the kind of impassioned plea for a strategy from Yoav Gallant. We really have two people who are held still in pretty high regard by some of Israel's allies, particularly in Washington. Two people saying that we're on the wrong course and we need to do something about it. And for me, that is the return of naked politics after months in which the government came together, the nation came together in the wake of the awful events of October the 7th. That sense of unity in the government, that is crumbling, and it is crumbling rather visibly. Paul Adams, diplomatic correspondent in Jerusalem. For the first time this century, boxing has an undisputed world heavyweight champion in training. Alexander Usyk has boxed Britain's Tyson Fury in a split points decision in the South Africa Riyadh. Billed as the dust up in the desert, the fight he won four heavyweight titles is another sign of Saudi Arabia's growing influence in world sport. After the fight, Usyk was taken to hospital for a scan on his jaw before attending a post-match news conference. There he was asked about the split decision. I don't worry. I don't know why. Because I, uh, I believe 